Well, good morning and welcome to our Life Steps class for Sunday, the October 18th, 2020. Today we're going to cover a couple of details left over from last week's class and then begin to look at the first verse of Psalm 34. Today's class will be approximately 12 to 15 minutes. But before we do all that, let's turn to the Lord in prayer as we open the Holy Scriptures. Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's begin with a little exercise concerning the music of the Psalms. Now, the book of Psalms has been described as a collection of prayers and worship songs, sung and spoken in public and private worship. The writing of the Psalms spanned a period of about 1450 B.C. to about 450 B.C., a period of approximately 1,000 years during which the Psalms were written. A certain Suzanne Hake Ventura, in her work, Music of the Bible Revealed, says that she has deciphered the musical accentual system preserved in the Masoretic text. She argues that certain marks in the text were a method of recording hand signals by which the temple musicians were directed in the performance of music. Using her system, this may give us some idea of what a psalm would have sounded like sung by a temple choir. And so I have, for demonstration purposes, been able to find Psalm 113 rendered in that way, according to her musical uh, plan. So if this works out, just listen for about a minute and 46 seconds, I think it is. And you can turn to Psalm 113 in your scriptures if you'd like to and follow along that way. I would give you the word of caution. It is in Hebrew. So um, let's get the ball rolling here. This would be Psalm 113 in the Hebrew according to um, this one lady's interpretation of the original musical annotations. Hallelujah, hallelujah, te Adonai, hallelujah, Shem Adonai, Yehishem Adonai, Nebona, Meata, Me Adonai, Mizrach Shem Eshar Mebohu, Mebulah Shem Adonai, Rahal Tolgohi, Okay, that was beautiful, wasn't it? Well, again, we don't know that that's exactly what the psalm would have signed, sounded like sung by the temple choir. We don't know that. We don't have any way of knowing that. However, I think we are on solid ground when we say that the music performed in the temple would have been beautiful. Indeed, God had gifted his people with amazing musical talent. The Jews, the Hebrews, were given um, a, a wonderful talent musically, which they possess to this day. And also, we know that the um, the temple music was performed by professional musicians who is, um, whose sole job it was to perform the music, professional singers and players on instruments. We know the music would have been beautiful. It would be a marvelous thing to, to be there, but that's not going to be... Um, possible. 
we have a couple of other notes from last week's class, and we're going to start with um, with this one. We said at the end of the class in our background information that David fled after leaving the court of a certain King Achish of Gath, fearing for his own life once again. He left that um, the Philistine king and went to the cave of Adullam, and there he was joined by his brothers and his father's household from Bethlehem, because apparently they had caught wind that their lives would also be in danger, being the family of David. And that that makes a lot of sense, I suppose, to them. Also, there were other dis, distressed and discontented people who gathered around him there as their leader. There were some 400 in total. So, the the thing I wanted to point out was about this group of people. It was not at all uncommon in the ancient Near East for such bands of malcontents and other social misfits, if that's what you want to characterize these people as, David's band of merry men, social misfits. Apparently, this is not at all uncommon in the ancient Near East, and we're often elsewhere known as Hapiru, Hapiru. What does that sound like, Hapiru? Well, this term Hapiru has also been associated with the term Hebrew. I'll read a little bit of a definition here. Hapiru and Habiru, a people known as Habiru or Hapiru, appear in cuneiform text dated from the, the 20th to the 18th centuries BC. In Egyptian text, they are called Yapiru or Apiru, and uh, many scholars note the similarity of these forms with the Hebrew Ibri and conclude that the Habiru or Hapiru are identical with the biblical Hebrews. So that the uh, the biblical Hebrews then would have derived their name from something like the wandering group or band or, um, you know, something along those lines. The term was also apparently other u- also used for smaller bands of groups or, or rootless people who um, wandered. Um, Another thing that we didn't point out last week that's worthy of note is that this is an acrostic psalm, meaning that each of the verses starts with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You don't see it in the English translation, excuse me, but it is there for, for one thing, it was an aid to memorizing and reciting the psalms. So if this were done or if it carried through over into the English translation, you'd have verse 1 starting with A, verse 2 starting with B, verse 3 starting with C, verse 4 starting with the letter D, and and right down through the alphabet. So that's also worthy of note, I thought. And another point would be, uh, this makes perfect sense because there are 22 verses in the psalm and there are 22 consonants in the Hebrew alphabet. So each one would use a successive um, letter of the Hebrew alphabet as they go through. Okay, let's see if there's anything we had left from last week. I'm sure there's plenty. Again, though, if you have any questions or comments, complaints, well, let's leave it at, let's leave it at comments. Um, and, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch with me and we'll try to answer those. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, something of the structure of the psalm. We also have to say a word about the structure of the psalm. If you open your copy of the scriptures to Psalm 34, and you're going to see there's there are three sections. In verses 1 through 7, there is an individual's thanksgiving section. And you know it's an individual section because he, he uses the first person pronouns. That is, this um, this this psalm then, when performed in a public setting, say in the temple, um, religious ceremony, for example, worship ceremony, um, the reader of the psalm, if it were being read, and it might be sung also, um, he would sp- speak to the audience. And in the first person, say with verse 1 in the NIV, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. And this is the first seven verses here where the individual is speaking to his audience or the reader or the listener in the first person. And then in the uh, the second portion of the psalm, which is verses 18 through, I'm sorry, 8 through 14, we find that imperatives dominate. And this is a, this is a section of exhortation. In other words, the psalmist or the speaker or the singer is exhorting the audience, the listeners, the readers, the hearers, 
to do something, if you turn to uh, like verse 8 and verse 9, taste and see that the Lord is good. Then verse 9, fear the Lord, you his saints. So here, the speaker, the singer, is exhorting his audience or his readership or his listeners to do something. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Fear the Lord, you his saints. And then if you drop down to verses 15 through 22, this is a, this is a, a section of praise or instruction, which has similarities to the praise literature where a person is pass, passes along to others the accumulated wisdom of his life. And these verses are all statements, wisdom statements for people to gain um, wisdom from. F take, for example, verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Verse Verse 19, a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So that's a kind of a basic idea of what the structure of the psalm is, and it makes a great deal of difference when it's being sung or performed or read by the individual reader. It's adapted, you know, in the temple, would be in the worship ceremony to be sung or to be spoken as a kind of a liturgical thing where the people were participating in the worship. And in, as in the case of... Um, I think verses two and three, if you look at those, the individual is actually asking the his audience to participate with him. He says in verse three, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. So if you take careful note of the pronouns, you will find that um, the psalm involves the participation of the listeners, the readers, the worshipers, the hearers. So I think that that's also worthy of note before we really get started to, um, you know, looking at the verses of the uh, the psalm one by one. Speaking of which, it uh, appears to me that we have exhausted the available time. And so we're going to be getting started with a um, verse by verse comments on the psalm next week. Um, and that is about all that we have time for today. So next week, Lord willing, we'll do just that. We will start with a verse-by-verse -verse study of this remarkable psalm, Psalm 34. Thank you and have a fantastic week.